The question is, do we go in a line or a circle? Is this life our beginning on Earth, on our way to bigger and better things, or are we living out a multi-layered journey on this planet, being born over and over again in different lives and as different people? This is probably the greatest dividing line among people who believe in a conscious afterlife, or at least one of them. But is it really an either or? Could Swedenborg's accounts of the rotating elevation of angels, what we spiritually pass to our children, and the communal nature of thought shed light on a structure that accounts both for people's vivid recollections of what seem to be past lives and the traditional belief in an eternal heavenly home? And could that dynamic explain why both the linear and circular theories of the afterlife are so prevalent? Stay tuned. everybody, welcome back to another episode of Swedenborg and Life. Tonight we're going to be asking the question, do we reincarnate? My name is Curtis Childs and I'm the host, so I'll be, I'll be taking you guys through that question. We're going to begin by looking here at this great dichotomy, and the dichotomy is framed in the title question. It could also be framed with this question, do we stay or come back? And this stay right here could mean two things. One, it could mean if we go to an afterlife, and this show is starting with the assumption that there is a conscious afterlife, if we go to the afterlife, do we stay there or do we stay here on Earth? Do we have multiple lifetimes in this same environment trying to work on things? And we're going to come at this from a Swedenborgian perspective, which is what we do on this show, and it's a good time to remind you how Swedenborg came to the conclusions that he did. It wasn't uh, a theoretical, I'm, I'm smart, so I'm going to synthesize the things I know and what feels right, and that's what I'm going to do. His was observational, meaning he claims to have had these trips, uh, you know, astral travels or out-of-body experiences or spiritual experiences, whatever you want to call them, were there he observed and recorded things, and, and that's what we ended up with. So, based on that, he went to this world and kept going and kept coming back and, and writing things. What did he see? Do we reincarnate? What's the answer? Let's take a look. Uh, right now, do we reincarnate? No. Well, I mean, yes, sort of. I mean, ish. But how can that be? Aren't these two things... Are, isn't reincarnating and not reincarnating total opposites? Not quite. Or if they could have any meeting point, these two great philosophies on the afterlife, I think that it's Swedenborg. And so we're going to show you what that might look like. Let's do a graphic. Why not? This can help clear everything up. we got three levels of existence. Bottom is the physical level. That's where we are right now, unless you are somehow tuning in through the veil. Uh, we have then the spiritual world, which Swedenborg differentiates into heaven and a world of spirits. Uh, so we're, we're going with those levels here. Let me give you the basics of, of the two major uh, theories on afterlife. So first you have what you could call the Western tradition. This would be Christianity and other uh, faith traditions that say, we're here on earth, and then you die, and you get, to, if you're lucky, you get to heaven, or if you do something right, you get to heaven, and then you stay there. Heaven's the new home, and that's where you stay. Then you, would, you have what you could broadly call Eastern traditions, uh, where you're here, you die, you go somewhere, but then you come back. You're born again into this life, and you continue to repeat these cycles, you know, at times on your way to something. It depends on which tradition you're looking at. Swedenborg represents what I think is kind of a middle ground. He does say that we leave earth, the earth plane and never come back. However, a lot of the cycles that we see played out in the, the theology around reincarnation, he describes as happening, but between the different levels of the spiritual world rather than between the spiritual and physical. So essentially he's saying, what reincarnation is saying do, is true, but on a spiritual level. So let's take a look at what, what actually could that mean. And before we go any farther, we've got to say that we're using sort of a pop culture definition of reincarnation, meaning you can study your whole life and not know everything there is to know about the different traditions around this broad topic. And there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of different paths within there that have different ideas about it and different, different courses that it follows. So we're just coming at it and the terms we'll be using f from the modern 
pop discussion around them. Meaning this is the kind of stuff you encounter on YouTube. Uh, this is the kind of stuff you encounter in things like songs and movies about this topic. So we're going to go at it from that relatively unscientific or, or unacademic perspective because we want to talk about the ideas that people are actually talking about in the larger conversation and to see where does Swedenborg mesh with those. So let's begin with probably the most potent discussion surrounding the idea of living multiple times on this planet and also the place where Swedenborg may clash the most heavily. So let's begin with part one. Yeah, so as I said, this is this is a pretty big divergence that we're coming into here. And I know that people uh, on both sides, people with a permanent afterlife view and people with reincarnation are, are can be pretty invested in it. And I'm going to say we can't give everyone everything they want here. We're going to try. I'm just going to do my best to report what Swedenborg found and you guys take it from there and, and do what feels best to you. And I do want to say that Swedenborg doesn't have a lot of direct commentary on the idea of reincarnation. Uh, he knew the idea existed. There were some ancient Greeks and other philosophers that talked about the, the concept, so he knew it was there, but mostly he's actually commentating on it through his system, meaning he's talking about what the purpose of this physical world is in the first place, and in learning the purpose, you see kind of the nature of it and, and why you would or wouldn't come back to it. So let's explore the foundations of his system for some ideas about the probability of reincarnation within it. All right, so here's another diagram. Uh, this is, we've got the spiritual world and the physical world, and we're going to talk about the point of the body. You have these two worlds, that white outline is us, it's our physical body, body, and according to Swedenborg, it's a container and foundation for forming our spiritual body. So while we're living this life as physical people, we are sort of in a womb, in a sense, to the spiritual, that we are, as we go through this life, solidifying and um, uh, making our spirit in a particular way, through the ways that we act and live and choose. And the physical body is, as we all know, made of what Swedenborg calls the outermost and final substances of creation. This would be stuff like carbon. This is the material or matter that we all see and we all agree upon. And he says that this is actually the essential order for all conscious humans. Uh, so every angel that he meets, every evil spirit that he meets, he says, at one point, they all went through this same process that we did, because this is just how you build a conscious spiritual being. And there's a reason for it. It's because this outermost level that we're all on right now has is these characteristics that make it conducive to doing just this. It's physical, it's time-bound. He says the spiritual world does not run by time in the way this one does. It's stable and it's constant, whereas the spiritual world is more fluid. It's solid, but it's it uh, changes in response to thoughts and feelings. It's not as static as this. So this level we're on right now is perfect for creating this container and maintaining it. Um, and what the container does is essentially not as, as crudely as we're depicting here, but it holds the inward substances together that are coming. And these inward substances, as I said, that pink and white, uh, that's goodness and truth. And that's the spiritual substance. It's not just goodness and truth that sounds like, you know, feelings and thoughts. But on a spiritual level, those are matter. That is like the carbon of the spiritual world. And it's coming to us via the Lord through the spiritual world. But it's not just flowing into nothing. It's flowing into our container. So as this process moves forward, Swedenborg says that our involvement in what he calls civic and moral forms of truth and goodness in our lives anchors the substances of our spirit. So the way that we act in in society with others, in the way, in the choices that we make, and the reasons for choosing those, we are accepting, arranging various kinds of goodness and truth. If we reverse it, it turns into evil and falsity. We're forming this composite, though, that is us. And what this does is when the body disintegrates, as you see, the goodness and truth, the spiritual substance has been formed. This process makes it so we can be continuously existent and permanently our unique self that can grow in love and wisdom eternally. You couldn't 
see the person is up there in the top, but it's not just this flowy mass of white and pink like it was before. You couldn't form something that solid simply in the spiritual world without initially having the physical world as a container. That's just what it takes to make the body. So that is the point of the physical world. And once you shed the body, you don't need it anymore. It's just like in this physical life here, once we're out of the womb, you do a lot of developing, but you don't need the womb again. It's you, You've already got that part formed. So you're on, you're forming through what you're eating and, and through the exercise you're doing and, and et cetera, et cetera, right? So that's Swedenborg's view is that this physical world is again, just a jumping off point to the spiritual world. But that seems to conflict directly with what is the most commonly written about phenomenon regarding reincarnation, which is this, remembering past lives. And how are you gonna, you can't ignore that. There's tons of people who have had experiences of remembering things that they've never done in their life. Kids will give these very accurate descriptions of this is who I used to be 40 years ago, and people, or, or 80 years ago, and people will go look up the records, and it turns out they were, and they couldn't have known that. So it's not something you can just dismiss. So what what would Swedenborg say to all that stuff? Now, while there, weren't that same, there wasn't that same kind of literature around when he was there, he does actually address this phenomenon of remembering past lives directly in Heaven and Hell 256. So our first quote of the day, remember, you can click this, get this book for free, uh, download. Angels and spirits actually have a memory just as we do. If a spirit were to talk with us from her or his own memory, then it would seem to us entirely as though the thoughts were our own, when they would really belong to the spirit. It's like remembering something that we have never seen or heard. I have been granted knowledge of the truth of this by experience. He goes on, this is why some of the ancients were of the opinion that after some thousands of years they would return to their former life and all its deeds, and that they had in fact returned. They gathered this from the fact that sometimes a kind of memory would come up of things that they had never seen or heard. So that's the phenomena of past lives. This is Swedenborg's explanation. This happened because spirits had flowed from their own memory into the images of these people's thoughts. So he acknowledges the phenomenon, but gives an alternate explanation, that it's not you looking into your own past, it's you looking into the past of the spiritual community and their lives on this planet. And that might sound like an even weirder explanation, or it's just this isolated thing. Why would he say that? How does that fit into anything? But you've got to remember, with Swedenborg, the communal model of consciousness, or that our thoughts and feelings are interacting with the spiritual world, is everywhere in his theology. It's the, you could say it's the bedrock of his theology, is that we are sharing experience or being influenced by the spiritual world all the time. Uh, for example, there, we did a show called Where Thoughts Come From, right, which was based on his spiritual experience journal writings, where he talked about getting a single mental image and being shown how many, not just spirits, but communities of spirits were interacting with that concept, were influencing it, shaping it, delivering it, and participating with him in the thought. So this was the norm, and this was very surprising to him when he first began to have experiences surrounding it. But not only that, we also talked about how things are more communal in the afterlife. In heaven, we reported in a short clip that Swedenborg reported this. According to Swedenborg, in the afterlife, you're going to be able to go, man, I'm having such a good day today. Do you want to know how it feels? Feels pretty cool, huh? Yes, it does, little Curtis. That is the nature of the spiritual world. You can, here we think about internal experience, how I think about something, how it feels, whatever this, the, the audio and the visual inside me, nobody has direct access to that. You can be at a concert with somebody and you're both experiencing the same thing, but you know you, you're having your own feelings about it, you're having your own separate experience. There he says the, the silos around people dissolve, that you can share thoughts directly, you can share feelings directly. He talks about coming into a society and suddenly having all their knowledge, as if he had always known it there. Not to mention, it's not just the waking life, it's also dreams. We had an episode called Where Dreams Come From, and he was shown every aspect of his dream life and how it was influenced by spirits. Check out any of those episodes if you want more about it. The point that I'm making is the idea that we could be funneling, have someone else's memory uploaded into us 
while strange to a regular person, is not strange in the Swedenborgian context. It's actually a seamless sort of part of his philosophy. So that's his explanation. He's saying this is actually an indicator of the closeness of the spiritual world. It's not supposed to happen that you remember someone else's memories, but it does happen. Now, I know that that is not really giving people who think there really are past lives much, because it seems to say there are none, but at least he acknowledges the phenomenon, whereas a lot of the permanent afterlife traditions just won't even talk about afterlife experiences. But even though, so right, so there we go, we still got a split, but even though we have this split, I still want to argue that there is common ground between these two, and we're really going to look at what I feel like is that common ground, because while Swedenborg doesn't say, right, that you can come back into the physical world, he does seem to describe a lot of what you find in the ideas of reincarnation as happening, as I said, in the spiritual world and in the different levels there. That's sort of like, after we get out of this life, there's all kinds of reincarnation type stuff there. I'll show you what I mean in part two. Again, remember, we're using sort of a pop understanding of this term karma. It means a lot of different things in different schools of thought, but we do want to address the ways that it's most commonly used. For example, a lot of people talk about karma. So we're going to talk about karma and see where are their analogs in what Swedenborg describes. So people talk about karma as a system of reward and punishment. You'll get people saying, uh, you know, this good thing is happening because I did something good in this life or in a past life, or more often it's why is this bad thing happening? I must have done something bad in a past life, or I must have done something bad earlier in this, that it's balancing out because there's this sort of law of retribution. Swedenborg says that that does happen, but it happens in rather than here in the physical world, it's happening in the spiritual world. So this is Heaven and Hell 509. Every evil brings with it its own punish oh every evil brings its own punishment with it. They are united. So whoever is involved in something evil is involved in the punishment of the evil as well. Still, no one suffers any punishment for evil things done in the world, only for current evil deeds. When he's saying that he's talking, if you see the context of this quote, he's talking about in the spiritual world. So this stuff happens in the spiritual world. It doesn't it's not like a rap sheet you got on earth, you did all these bad things, now you gotta suffer to even the scales, but it's like you only get retribution for things you do now. However, it boils down to the same thing, though. It makes no difference whether you say that we suffer punishments because of our evil deeds in the world, or that we suffer punishments because of our evil deeds in the other life, because after death we all return to our life, which means that we are involved in the same kinds of evil. This is because our nature is determined by the kind of physical life we led. So it's not that you would get to the afterlife and they would say, well, you did this, this, and this, so now these bad things are going to happen to you. But if you spend your life cultivating a love for doing harmful things and acting them out, you don't just shuck that now that you're in the afterlife. You're going to end up doing those same kinds of things if you've built those habits up, and that's when this sort of instant karma kicks in. So there's, I see that as, as an agreement there, but that does sort of leave out what, what happens on the physical. If Swedenborg is saying that, that it's not that same law of retribution directing things in the physical, what is directing things in the physical? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's the explanation according to Swedenborg. So we have uh, this chance, right? chance in the world. You can't deny that there's chance. People are born into different situations. Things happen to one person, don't happen to another. What is it? Is it karma? What's causing all of this? Swedenborg would actually would describe it with the term providence. And there are some differences between the idea we just discussed of this retribution and reward system and Swedenborg's idea of providence. So let's take a look at them here. What What is determining external circumstances, or what are external circumstances? Are they the result of previous things we've done? Swedenborg says that actually external circumstances could be defined as the means, and specifically the means for divine providence to accomplish what it wants to accomplish. What does that mean? Well, let's confuse it further with this number from Swedenborg. This is Arcana Celestia 8478. Divine providence is over all. That is, it is present within the smallest details of all. People in the stream of providence are being carried along constantly toward happier things, whatever appearance the means may present. The means, 
in that sh- sentence indicates that the means are what is carrying us along towards happier things. The means are external circumstances. So according to Swedenborg, everything that is happening here is divine providence bringing us into heaven. That slowly but surely, d- despite the ups and downs in physical life, every situation is being is being affected to bring us into more and more of a heavenly mindset and to let us grow spiritually. However, that immediately brings up the question of what about bad stuff? You know, there, there's this idea of negative karma to explain why do people go through things? Why are there such unfair distributions uh, of wealth and opportunity and, and luck in the world? Swedenborg says that it's not because providence is you know, giving some people a really hard life and others an easier life, he says that evils are foreseen. Evil is foreseen, not provided. Meaning, divine providence is not causing the evil things that we do to each other, but is working with them to bend them to good as much as can be, and only allowing things that ultimately lead, in the end, to a greater good. Now, we're opening up this can of worms, which is the problem of evil, which is really not what this show is about, but it's what another show is about. We we made this program here, Why Bad Things Happen, Click that link up there. If you are interested in that conversation, check that out. We just wanted to show you some of the difference between uh, what happens here in the physical world and how it is, according to Swedenborg, in the spiritual world, which reflects the idea of karma. Let's end with a quote. Divine providence consists of the fact that it is constantly allowing things to happen for a purpose and is permitting only things that serve that purpose nothing else. It is constantly examining the evils that that are allowed to emerge, separating them, purifying them, banishing the ones that do not suit its purpose, and lifting them away in ways we cannot see. So everything that makes it to reality here is very, very carefully vetted. It may not seem like that. It seems like random, terrible things are happening all the time, senseless things. But according to that, divine providence is not causing those things, (laughs) but is mitigating them, using only letting a few through when in the end it can lead to something better. All right, so that's just one sense of karma, though. There's a lot of other ways people use the term and a lot of other crossover, I believe, with Swedenborg stuff. For example, people talk about karma in terms of dealing with recurring issues. There's a song by the Indigo Girls. Would you like me to sing it? How long till my soul gets it right? Right, this idea of multiple lifetimes trying the same thing, trying to solve a particular issue, and you see this come up. Swedenborg says that does take place, but he just provides different characters in that in that action. Here's what that means. <clears throat> you have this idea of an issue, oops, an issue that you want to solve, and in reincarnation, it's one person coming back to that over many lifetimes to solve that issue. Swedenborg and it has this concept of heredity, or spiritual heredity, in which he said there are many lifetimes working on a single issue, but it's happening across generations. We all have a spiritual character. We work on our issues and try to hopefully get better. We pass that along to our kids, and they pass it on to theirs. We received ours from our parents and their grandparents. You're carrying almost spiritual genetics, and that can be positive and negative. Some of it are these issues, like these tendencies toward particular things that we're working on. So it is a lot of people working on the same issue, because if I make progress in a good direction, that makes it easier on my kids, and if hopefully they do better, it makes it easier. So we are working on these issues over many lifetimes. It's just through different people instead of through one person returning as different people. So I see that as a pretty close, uh, pretty close correlation with just sort of, yeah, yeah, who's the cast, a little bit different. Um, But that's not all. There's this idea of uh, what you could call lifetime reduction, which people associate with karma. In certain traditions, you're talking about if you repeat lives and keep doing better and better, you eventually don't have to do as much in the next life, or you can escape the cycle altogether and and achieve enlightenment. So there's, if we put in the work now, you save yourself spiritual work later. That's an idea that you find in reincarnation. And Swedenborg seems to indicate that that does happen. It doesn't mean that you get less or better lives here, but you do save yourself a lot of hard work in the spiritual world, or the, specifically the world of spirits, which is the section of the spiritual world, Swedenborg says, you come and do first. I know, it's not confusing at all. Um, and he, we did a, a show about this, 
It was called How You End Up in Heaven or Hell, and he likened our passage into heaven to the digestive system. He actually says it's a direct correspondence, that this, that our digestive system is a little picture of the great journey we all go on in the spiritual world. He says that just like when you're eating something, there are some simple sugars and things that can actually just go right through the lips. They're so ready to be in the body, you don't need anything. Those of us who are tougher, complex fatty acids or something, we maybe need to be chewed, and if that doesn't let us in, then we have to be digested. There's these multiple chambers you see in here. There's If you can't get absorbed through the stomach, you got to go into all these intestines. There's all these opportunities, but each one is more and more processing. That's a picture of us needing to do a lot more work in the spiritual world if we aren't getting it done here. Uh, He actually gives a story of a guy who, because he had developed this nature of love in this life, didn't barely have to do any work once he got to the world of spirits. This is from Secrets of Heaven 318. A man came and spoke to me who, as certain signs indicated, had recently departed from life. At first he did not realize where he was, supposing himself to be in the world. I then informed him that he was in the next life and that he had no longer had any possessions, house, money, and so on, but was in another realm where he lacked everything he had owned in the world. Filled with anxiety over this, he did not know which direction to go or where he would live, but I told him that the Lord alone looks out for him and for everyone. Afterward, I left him alone to think as he had thought in the world. He started to wonder. Everyone's thoughts can be perceived clearly in the other life. What he should do now, being destitute of everything that allowed him to stay alive. Still laboring under this anxiety, he was transferred to the company of spirits with a heavenly nature. They were in the vicinity of the heart, and everything he wanted, whatever it was, they helped him with. This done, he was again left alone, and under the inspiration of charity, began to consider how he could repay such great kindness. All this showed that in the life of the body, he had possessed the charity that belongs to faith. As a result, he was lifted up into heaven instantly. So because he had that charity or love in his heart, he fit right in with angels, with the angelic mindset. Imagine if he hadn't thought about, he didn't care about paying back that, he didn't even care about the things they brought him because he doesn't want that kind of life anyway, he wants something different. You could see how there might need to be more work done, or if some kind of issue was keeping him from embracing mutual love, you might need more work. And Swedenborg says that actually there can be the opposite of what he went through, that we can need quite a long journey on the other side. This is Spiritual Experiences 1021. But there are numerous other paths of spiritual progress, some leading through many years of chastenings and and repeated agitations lasting many years, in fact centuries and thousands of years. Some have winding courses long in distance and time. So he talks about people in the world of spirits before getting to their final destination, going through these huge long journeys. Now it's a little confusing because he does say that in other places that the spiritual world has sort of been reformed to the point where now you only spend like 20 or 30 years there at the max. However, he says there's not really time, so it's got to be some kind of approximation. I think the takeaway is it can be very quick or it can be quite a long journey it before you you choose yourself a heaven or a hell. And I think that that kind of mirrors this idea of working lifetime after lifetime to and shortening the progress you have in there. So those are some correlations, but I think the, the, the greatest crossover between what Swedenborg has to say and the ideas in reincarnation is going to be shown to you here in part three. So it's the order of things that we get purified by cycles. We are much like clothes who go through a spin cycle or something like that. I should, man, I should write poetry. If you, you'll notice that there are uh, cycles everywhere 
this is something you just go through in life. For example, there's the day-night cycle, right? There are cycles in the weather. There are even people-made cycles in traffic. There are the seasonal cycles that we see everything go through. There are daily cycles where biological organisms respond to stimuli like sunlight and temperature, and you see things repeat and repeat. Swedenborg says that these are representations of deeper spiritual things that are happening, and so we too go through these cycles in our hearts and minds or in our spirits. We did a show called How to Live in Eternity Now, in which we described that in the spiritual world, people go through these spiritual days and nights and spiritual seasonal cycles, and that that is related to the things inside them. Even angels go through these cycles, he says. Even angels experience something close to spiritual night. They experience things like spiritual winter. They have better and worse times. But but why? Why would angels need that kind of that kind of work or lessons in the first place? Aren't they angels? Well, he describes here in Heaven and Hell 150. By alternations of delight and discomfort, angels' perception and sensitivity to what is good become more and more delicate. The angels have gone on to say that the Lord does not produce these changes of their states, since the Lord as the sun is always flowing in with warmth and light that is, with love and wisdom. Rather, they themselves are the cause, since they love their sense of self, and this is constantly misleading them. So even angels can have an ego, right? It doesn't totally just get wiped away. It goes dormant, but it's there, and sometimes it pops up, and it can cause problems. And when it does, angels actually need to go through a cycle, which, as you'll see, has bears some similarity to the idea of reincarnation. Swedenborg describes it broadly like this. We're, so we're here on earth, and when we're on earth, we accumulate good things, but also some dust and dirt, you know, spiritually speaking, falsities, evils, things that cling to us. However, once we leave this world, we leave some of that behind, we also shed things in the world of spirits and get up to heaven. But even in heaven, there are things we need to shed. So we periodically, he says, cycle out of heaven into these lower states and continue to shed harmful things. But as you'll notice, each time we're going a little higher and higher. It's not just a repeat, it's a moving upward through these cycles. So it's not a reincarnation to the earth level, but there is this traveling between these different levels of the spiritual world. So that is the general principle and how it works, but we want to give you a specific example from that that Swedenborg talks about, and it happens when an angel encounters a new situation, something that stirs something in them, and it goes like this. Uh, There's angels in heaven, right? They're hanging out, and this new situation pops up, and it pulls up whatever falsity or ego something, whatever is not uh, real great in a particular angel, and because of that, they move out of the heavenly community. And there's two reasons for that. The Swedenborg talks about in two different places. He says in Spiritual Experiences 2597, the reason that they embrace, the reason is for this movement that they embrace some falsity, and therefore when among those who embrace the truth, they cannot help being distressed. And they then seem to themselves to fall down. That they stop thinking like the people around them, they stop vibing with the people around them, they're just, I can't I can't really feel comfortable in this because of a particular something that's latched onto. The other reason is that lest the society be infected by the falsity, the angel falls out of heaven. So you want to get out of there. There's danger in you being in there because you you have something that you could pass on to people. So you go through this cycle. They are sent back among lower spirits, to whom they are then entirely familiar. So they're in the same state of mind as these other people they go to, and there they feel like, okay, I can breathe again, and uh, everything makes sense, but then they start to go through this process there in this new environment of learning, where Swedenborg talks about uh, them He says, in this way, heaven is freed of falsities, but when they have been instructed in the world of spirits and thus bettered, which we saw that flying off, they are taken back again. So they go there to this lower plane to learn, right? Isn't that a lot like what we hear, except it's not incarnating the carnal back into the physical, but it is going into these lower states. Uh, Okay, so that is the nature of that, and that's not the only place where there's very 
intense similarities between reincarnation and what Swedenborg describes. There's another one here that, that happens in Swedenborg's world, but only happens in the spiritual side, and we, we were uh, getting this together, and one of our writers, Karin, uh, discovered this, so here's her briefly describing this other similarity. In the concept of reincarnation, a person is born back into Earth life and, for the most part, forgets who they used to be. Well, Swedenborg reports that this kind of thing sometimes does happen in the spiritual realm. He, in his journal, he tells some stories about seeing angels coming down into the world of spirits for a purification process who temporarily forgot about their life in heaven. He also reported that sometimes spirits who are with a person on Earth temporarily think they are that person on earth and forget their own separate identity. So this can sometimes happen and then they remember as they go back up into the higher state of mind. This can seem weird unless we realize this does happen in our own earthly mental lives too. If I go into a state of despair for a while, I might temporarily forget that there's anything good about my life or that anybody loves me or I ever do anything right. But if I'm in a more spiritually mature state, then I can remember that good things about my life even when I'm going through a hard time. So there's this vast variety in how the processes work according to what's best for each person and who, according to what stage they're in in their spiritual development. And Swedenborg writes about that. Angels actually, for a time, for previous life, the coming down, almost living as someone else. And the, the spirits who we talked about before in this past life segment who are close to us like that, they sometimes think that they're us, so they think they're somebody else, but they actually have this other life. All kinds of correlations there. It just is happening in slightly different contexts than is traditionally described by reincarnation. And this, But this process that we talk about of, of improvement, the cycles of improvement that angels go through, according to Swedenborg, is not something they do for a little while and then they're done. This goes on and on. They, you keep circling higher and higher forever. This is Secrets of Heaven 4803. Good spirits and angels continually change and pro- progress in regard to their state. As a result, they move deeper into the interior of the region they inhabit, and therefore into more excellent functions. In heaven, everyone is constantly being purified and created over again, so to speak. So it keeps getting better and better. See our show, The Heaven Project, for this idea that heaven is always expanding. It's not this static thing. We are going through these cycles, getting better and better and better. So, as a recap, let's wrap up what we've learned here today. So there, we looked at reincarnation, and so there are some definite differences between Swedenborg's view and reincarnation. He sees what many people call past lives, memories, as a window into the spiritual communities we're with, rather than into our own past. But there are many similarities as well, and the spiritual world Swedenborg describes displays many of the concepts associated with reincarnation, but with some new twists and contexts. But whatever your point of view, the goal is the same, right? It's about moving up, breaking free of everything limited and hostile to true life. I like the Swedenborg sort of middle way because it can show that maybe in some ways we're all right or that we've got a partial piece of a complex truth that's just as strange, fine-tuned, and ultimately elegant as the rest of life. And it could explain that, yeah, we're all just, you know that story about the elephant? We're all just sort of feeling different parts of the elephant. If you don't know the story, forget it. It was just a weird thing I said. Final thought to leave with you. Some people like the idea of reincarnation in this world because it doesn't put so much pressure on the life we're in right now. The idea that what you have one life to really get it right or wrong, heaven or hell, doesn't that seem like you really better do well? Swedenborg does say that this is our one life here, but he says that the thing that we're here to do in this world is actually quite simple. It's not that you need to get up to being an angel and being perfect. Even angels aren't perfect. Really, all that we're trying to do here is make a basic decision, which is, are we the most important thing in the universe, or do we acknowledge that other people and God have value too, and that we would, you know, want to help them out sometimes. I mean, that really is, on the basic level, the dichotomy as it stands. And all we got to do is just realize, hey, we're all in this together, and then we're on our way up. So if you want to experience um, some spiritual, enlightened, higher purification right this minute, like and subscribe. 
it'll do it. That's the one thing all the traditions agree on. If you like and subscribe our videos, you're going right to the top. Uh, thanks. We're going to get to your questions just like we said, but first, we're a nonprofit. If you want to support what we're doing here, make weird shows like this, here's a little bit about our philosophy. We want the ideas and insights we cover to be available for free to anyone, anytime they need them. That's why we offer Swedenborg's books as free downloads on Swedenborg.com, and we produce this show and other content on our Off the Left Eye YouTube channel with no paywall or ads. The only way to keep this up, though, is for those of you who like what we're doing and feel comfortable giving to give. If the idea of helping others have easy access to the content we produce feels meaningful to you, please consider supporting this cause with a donation. Give if you can, receive if you need. If we cycle through this way, in the end, everybody wins. All right, everybody wins, including everyone who uh, tries to answer these questions, whether or not they do a good job. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the first one. Monica. Hi, I'm curious if we retain our female or male energies after death. I think there are definite attributes of both. Is that related to the ego or part of our soul? Great question. And the answer, according to Swedenborg, is we do retain. That he says, being male or female is not just a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing. Uh, and that every little, even down to every little bit of you, Ha, if you're if you're male, it has a male energy. If you're feel, female, it has a female energy. Now, I'm not getting into the conversation about all the variants we're seeing uh, in like people with sexual identity and that kind of thing. Uh, it's not something you can just oh, it's all this. Life is complex. In broad generalities, he says that there is if you're if you're a guy, you stay a guy, and that these these forms. Yeah, right. It's not just an ego thing. It's a soul thing, and that, that we continue to get more and more in touch with that the more that we move. Great question, and I feel like that, that was like a definite answer that I gave. All right, one for one. Let's look at the next one. Lady Quinn, I have a question about organ transplants and reincarnation. So many cases of recipients adopting exact behaviors, qualities of the donor. Is this different completely or similar? Wow, I, I hadn't thought about that. Okay, but... Swedenborg does talk, you remember our body diagram in the beginning, the importance of um, uh, the physical body as a container for the spirit. If you have somebody else's organ, is some of their spirit with you? I have, I have no idea. Um, that, and is that similar to past lives, that kind of thing? I guess uh, there's differences, but, but as f I'm just going to give this one a solid I don't know. And it's a great question. It'd be like fascinating to do some research on and see what we can get to. But okay, so I don't have a good answer for that one. All right, one for two. That's pretty good. Let's look at the next one. Sharon, so it's as though we ha have now to practice doing the right things because in the spiritual life, the punishment is instantaneous. Is that correct? Uh, yes, yes and no. Although like Swedenborg does give this point, which we almost included in the show, but didn't quite that if you basically are willing to try to be good. Like, you you know that you want to be good, that, that it's, rather than just saying, I don't care about anybody, this is all stupid, I want my, if, you, if, you're, if you're on a path towards goodness, then he says, even the bad things that you do aren't, you're not punished for, or, you know, you're not punished for them. Uh, and that only if you've made your life evil do you receive punishment. And that might not seem fair, but the point is, punishment in itself in the afterlife is not just for the sake of revenge or something. It only happens for um, correction. And the only reason there is such a thing as punishment at all is that when, according to him, when you get somebody who is totally focused on evil, and that's what they want to do, and that's what they love, the only language, and we did a show called The Good Thing About Hell, where we talked about this, but the only language they understand is fear of punishment. So they would never stop doing anything. It's like somebody who would do all kinds of crimes, but is only worried about jail time or, or retribution from the people he's attacking or something. Um, that That's the reason why punishment would exist in the first place, is because that's the only way anybody should listen. So it's not like, in, get into the spiritual world and like, don't screw up, you'll get punished. If you're trying to be good, you don't need that... <clears throat> Sorry. As I was talking, I was like, I'm going to hold this cough back. I'm not going to cough. I'm going to drink during when I'm reading the question, but it didn't happen. Um, so anyway, my I think I already said the point, which is that if you're trying to go towards what is good, it's not like, you might stop, here's the punishment. It's only, the punishment is a last resort if you won't listen to anything else. 
So there you go. All right, let's. We got a couple more here. One or two. Um, Mr. Oakill two forty six. Where or what were we before being born? Yeah. So Swedenborg seems to indicate that there there's not previous lives, but he doesn't really give you. I mean, he doesn't directly talk about that. I mean, you know, we did a show where we talked about his idea that we are all essentially embodiments of God's feelings or God's longings. So in that sense, we were a part of God, but now we're manifested in like trying to become an independent, finite container for that feeling. So there was our potential before we existed, even if there wasn't um, us as we are before we were born. Uh, but he just doesn't talk about it that much. So um, I'm gonna, that's, that's all I can really give on this one. All right, we got one more question. This is from David. I understand karma. What does Swedenborg say about remorse in the afterlife for one's sinful, sinful actions in the physical realm? It's a great point, um, because regardless of punishment, I mean, do, do people care? Certainly. I mean, he talks about people having to see, much like life reviews described in modern near-death experiences, he talks about people's book of life and them seeing everything, and people people who tried to deny that they had ever done something wrong being shown in front of everyone, this is what it was. Um, and then certainly uh, people who are trying to be good feel this remorse of the things that they've done wrong. Um, this is a part of the process of owning things and understanding our impact on people. And I really think that the, the life review um, uh, blends seamlessly with that. I don't think you would sit around in remorse permanently. You would sort of understand and, and try your best to correct things and then move on. But I, I could see, and especially, I don't know about you, but how I feel is the more that I feel like I'm learning about what's really good in life, the more I sort of want to have remorse, or or I am understanding the essence of what things hurt people and how it hurts them. I want to like, I don't want to make that okay, even if I did it. Like, I want to feel like I shouldn't have done that and make amends. You sort of gain, I find, not that I've progressed very far, but I find that I, I'm having these these desires to, no, I, I want to be accountable for stuff, because it, overall you want what's, you're, you're trying to want what's true and good because it's true and good. So a little remorse sometimes is a good way to, to spur you into action, or at least to to um, make note that, hey, something was done here. So hopefully that's what, what you were asking. All right, cool, everybody. Thanks so much for hanging out. Um, it was good. Uh, we're going to do it again next week. And next week, we're going to be looking at God. And some people, I don't know, probably nobody that's made it this far in the show, but some people would say, you know, I don't think that God exists. And that leads us to an interesting subject, because if there is God, which many people are convinced there are, why do some people think there is and some people think there's not God? Why, if God has all power, why doesn't God just prove that he exists. Wouldn't that be a relatively simple thing for him to do? Well, we're going to be asking that very question next week. We're going to ask, why doesn't God prove he exists? Hope you can join us. See you then. Swedenborg and Life is a production of the Swedenborg Foundation. Curtis Childs is our host and producer. Art direction by Matthew Childs. Technical direction by Stuart Farmer. Ben Keyes, visual effects technician. The content writing team is Curtis Childs, Karen Childs, and Chelsea Odner. Regular research and content support from Dr. Jonathan Rose, series editor for the New Century edition of the works of Emanuel Swedenborg, and Cara Dom, Latin consultant for the New Century edition. Shada Sullivan contributes her heavenly voice to most of our readings. Amy Aquarola is our marketing communications coordinator. Alexa Cole is our online media coordinator. Our editor is John Connolly. The moderators for our thriving online community are Curtis Childs, Karen Childs, Alexa Cole, Chris Dunn, and Chelsea Odner. And the executive director of the Swedenborg Foundation is Morgan Beard. Special thanks this week and every week to the generous donors that make our work possible.